Hello, my name is Kim DeSico, and I'm the 2020 Delaware Division of the Arts Emerging Artist in Fiction. Today I'll be reading a short piece of mine titled Frost. Snow has fallen for most of the day. It started as dust, but grew heavier as the afternoon wore on. With darkness comes a strong wind that causes the house to admit low, extended moans. I imagine this sound is the genesis for many a ghostly story. Perhaps even the one grandmother told me about Caleb Lovegood, a ship hand who drowned at sea, not because he fell overboard, but because he was lashed to the bowsprit during a fierce storm as punishment for taking the captain's rum. A shiver runs along my spine as I sit at my desk and watch tiny spears of frost grow on the window. Each of the window's twelve panes were meticulously cut and set so we could enjoy a view without the elements intruding. Of course, frost isn't really an element, so it does what it chooses. Now it seems to flourish under my gaze, reaching, as if trying to grasp the falling snow. My desk is placed mid-room, so my back faces the fire. I expect the flames to wrap me with warmth and security like the feel of my mother's arms when she would rock me to sleep. But my expectations are not met. I remain chilled. Rattling glass now joins groans from deep within the house to form a tempestuous symphony. The frost seems to grow brighter, whiter, with each howl of wind as if it feeds on the sound. Again I shiver, more from this thought than any cold. What foolishness, I think, and push from my desk, my skirts brush its leg as I pass. Moving towards the window, I lay my hand on a wing-back chair. All real, all solid. I press my finger to the frost, then pull it away. A clear round spot is left where the ice has melted. Nothing to fear. It's no match against the warmth of my hand. But with each blast of wind, the frost regains substance, a translucent layer at first, then opaque crystals solidify as if alive. I touch the frost again. A bead of moisture remains on my finger as I move it away. I press this wetness to my lips. It's just water. Water with a hint of vinegar from cleaning the glass a few months ago. Again, nothing to fear. There isn't enough water in frost to hurt me. I'm not a captive ship hand. My heart startles at movement outside the window. I look past the frost and see evergreens in a chaotic dance timed to the wind-fueled orchestra inside my home. Each dip and bend tosses snow off of branches and, in, and into the blustery current. My nostrils flare as they catch the sharp scent of icy cold pushing through minute spaces around the window's frame. I am reminded of a time 40 years ago when I was seven and playing in the snow with my sister Sarah. We ran outside on a bright crisp morning after it had snowed all night. We dove into drifts and threw handfuls of snow in the air to catch on our tongues. It was only minutes before we were covered in white and rosy-cheeked. Father cleared a path to the barn and checked on our cow and horses. Once finished, he came out and lobbed snowballs in our direction, hitting us low on our skirts. With delighted squeals, we ran <clears throat> and attempted to tackle him. We had no luck. His strong, tall frame easily caught Sarah as she launched herself into his arms. My feeble attempt to collide with his legs resulted with me on my backside in the snow. Mother witnessed our folly from the doorway. She'd come to call us back inside, but turned her sight. We then all heard horses approaching. On their backs rode three men in black hats and cloaks. Elders. They came for Sarah, who was accused of consorting with the devil through a corn husk doll. She was only ten. 
They searched the house, but no doll was found. They took her anyway, still wet and cold from the snow. They put my sister in a dank prison cell, along with other accused. A cough settled upon her. A cough that seemed to drown her, they said. She was dead within a week. They brought her back to us in a cart. With tender hands, my father carried her inside and laid her on our trestle table. I stretched out a timid hand to move pale hair from her face. I stared for a long time and wondered at how still she was, how flat, now that life no longer animated her body. But it was her lips that mesmerized me. They were cracked and white, as if covered with frost.